We now return to the Transformers. Now I want to start season 3 off with a compliment because I really love the theme song for this season. I like the intro, we have good transitions between characters and locations, but what really does it for me is the theme song, especially the extended version on the end credits, like I don't know why, I think it's just because of the orchestra that you can hear because I am a big fan of orchestra music, and something about it just feels a bit more epic and cooler, a lot more kind of sci-fi as well. It really does blend in well with Season 3's premise, like how it mostly focuses on different planets, how it's mostly centred on Cybertron. Overall, it just feels a lot more epic. Also, I've just realised after all these years, this isn't Cup, it's Springer. My entire childhood has just been betrayed. Also, what is wrong with you? Why are you blue? No, oh, I'm afraid I just blew myself. <laughs> Episode 66, The Five Faces of Darkness, Part 1. Okay, so... In the wake of Unicron's defeat, the battered Decepticons struggle to survive and the Autobots enjoy a period of peace and celebration. But this is Transformers. The peace never lasts. The episode begins with the ending scene of a Transformers movie. Just in case if some kids didn't go to the theatres to watch the movie because, well, I can imagine some parents would want to prevent their child from being traumatised. I mean, they traumatised them enough with 80s clothing. What's really apparent straight away is the animation style, like we've got good solid animation in the 86 movie and then we transition into season 3 where it's like, ooh, yeah. The animation quality just kind of dipped, didn't it? And you know, I like the start of this episode. We've got the old Decepticons fighting over Energon and the new Decepticons doing an unfortunate salute. In the days of Megatron it was not like this. You mean Galvatron? Well, they were the same guy. <sighs> I feel you, Astro Train. One thing I don't understand though is why it's so loud in this scene. Like, can you please turn it down? Like, why, why is the energy on sound so loud? Please stop! Anyway, the Autobots are doing their own version of the Olympics, and we have these ugly looking aliens. What is this thing? Someone, please execute it. Oh, hey, look, original characters. Don't get used to it. This character right here wasn't even supposed to be Jazz. It was supposed to be a different character called Orgon, but someone mistakenly took the model of Jazz and just put it in. Didn't you want to say something about concord and tranquility in the galaxy? Ah, uh, give me a break. Wow, this new Autobot leader gives me a lot of confidence. This right here is one of the main issues with Season 3, the Hot Rod slash Rodimus arc. It just goes backwards and forwards. He wants to be the leader of the Autobots, and then he gets sick of being the leader of the Autobots. They just don't know how to characterize Rodimus Prime, and it gets insanely unbearable throughout the entire season. Why'd I have to be the chosen one? We have no idea, mate. Right, so I'm not going to go too deep into this episode because, well, I really don't want to. I mean, we've got five parts to talk about, and it's already exhausting. Like, a lot of characters are kidnapped by the Quintessons. Springer and RC go after this alien thing. Oh my god, I, I hate looking at it. Outback and Blaster go searching for some Decepticons. Not with my trusty Decepticon detector. No such thing. Why does he look like a Gobot? Cyclonus and the Sweeps go to Unicron's head to find out where Galvatron is. There is no wind in space. Quiet. Oh, so this show finally decides to follow the laws of science. Once they find out where Galvatron is, they go back to Char, and we've got more Decepticons looking battered and bruised. And you know what? I actually feel really sorry for the Decepticons. Me Grimlock not feel sorry. Me Grimlock laugh. <laughs> okay, never mind. So yeah, that was part one. Can we move on, please? Episode 67, The Five Faces of Darkness, part two. Gavatron is rescued by Scourge and Cyclonus, and they discover that there is something very wrong with their leader. Disturbs my plasma bath. Basically, he's insane. Long live! <laughs> Galvatron is like the main thing carrying season three for me. I love how insane he is. It makes sense story-wise. I know we just couldn't afford Leonard Nemo anymore, but hey, at least we got Frank Welker back, and he's very different from Megatron, so that's good. That's how you know you got a good actor anyway. If Galvatron was the same as it was in the movie, I feel like the Decepticon faction would be just boring, especially now that we've not got Starscream anymore, who added so much personality and life into the Decepticon faction. Now we have Galvatron, this insane maniac that brings that life back. 
Now, of course, I like Scourge and Cyclonus, but I like them even more that they have to deal with this lunatic. Meanwhile, with the Autobots, we've got Radamus and Grimlock going up against the Decepticons. Aww, Rumble's all grown up. And now they look really disturbing. I've never been creeped out before with a transformation. That is like, oh my god, that's disgusting. RC and Springer rescue Grimlock and Rodimus, but unfortunately, Rodimus is badly damaged. My time in the light is short. That's what Optimus Prime said when he was dying. Springer. Um, no, he didn't say that. RC, you were there. How do you not know you were there? I remember what he said. Oh, it's me, Maddie. I'm in heaven now. So Rodimus Prime goes on an acid trip that makes him learn more about the Quintessons. Meanwhile on Quintessa with Ultra Magnus, Spike and Cup are being held captive by the Quintessons. And they were supposed to have been massacred by the rebellious Sharktacons in the movie, but for some reason, they're still alive. They're not dead. Why? We'll never know. It never gets explained. You are the Autobot called Cup. You are Cybertron's chief of security. Nah, my name's Teaspoon, and I'm Cybertron's chief dishwasher. I like Cup. He's funny. But also senile. Why do I feel like I've seen this before? Because you've actually been here before. It wasn't that long ago. Dude, how old are you? Anyway, don't even ask. Spike somehow manages to hold one of them hostage. But it doesn't work and they send him down to the shock to comes. The Autobots are saved and escape through a massive silver bolt. The Quintessons decide to blow up their home planet Quintessa because reasons. And that's the end of part two. Episode 68, Five Faces of Darkness, Part 3. Desperate to destroy the Autobots, the Quintessons make a deal with the Decepticons. I'll briefly talk about the custom Five Faces of Darkness intro that for some reason is only on Part 3 and 5. It's alright, it's cool, the animation is still bleh, but I mean the transitions are kinda neat and I've talked about this before on my all intros ranking. I, I like the idea that they did a custom, it was pretty neat. We have the Decepticons attacking an Earth space platform and blowing Wheelie's ship. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention. Blow and wheelie. You know, I actually have no idea what they're doing at all. And you know, I actually can't tell who's more annoying. Wheelie or Blur. Now what? Beep, 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 alert, alert, alert. That's why. Like, I don't have enough frustration in my life without beep, 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 alert, alert, alert. Your words invective and your ship defective. I'm going to go with Wheelie. I wished Wheelie was on that ship. Meanwhile, the Autobots crash land on a bizarre planet called Goo. I used to stick stuff like this under my seat at school. Um, Spike, you're disgusting. Oh, and Springer gets sucked up by a giant machine and gets decapitated. Because that's a terrifying image. Gross. <laughs> Alright, so we've got the Quintessons going to the Decepticons and... Ugh, okay. Who plays Bruticus right next to the Combaticons? And why is Autobot Fireflight here? Okay, look, the only major thing to talk about this episode is actually Blitzwing. He's like the only Decepticon not to trust them. From a memory he can't recollect... And he pleads with Galvatron not to ally with them, and Galvatron does, and because of this, Blitzwing actually joins the Autobots, and he would be not trusted back into the ranks of the Decepticons. Now this tantalising plot thread was never actually developed in the cartoon. It was supposed to in Starscream's Ghost, but it was rewritten for Octane. I'll go into that episode when we get to it. But later on, they would say that he was like part of the Quinison drone army. It is a shame that Blitzwing's story never gets fully developed, because while he's the only original Decepticon that actually gets something to do, because even Soundwave, who's one of the most popular Decepticons, does nothing really in Season 3. He just gets forgotten. Anyway, whatever. Let's get into Part 4. Episode 69, Five Faces of Darkness, Part 4. It begins with the Decepticons attacking the Autobots, and oh my god, we have a disgusting shot here. All of these animation errors, I, I can't handle it. My brain, my brain hurts. At least I've got Galvatron making me laugh. Attack! Attack who? <laughs> Did he just run in space? Meanwhile, on the Autobot side, Springer is brought back to life by Retguard, and don't even ask how, it's never explained. It wasn't in the movie with Ultra Magnus, so I have no idea. Rodimus! Look who's back! Yeah, good to have you back, Springer. Well, don't let your enthusiasm overwhelm you! He is definitely holding a grudge from the movie that RC chose Springer instead of him. Anyway, Rodimus Prime kills himself in order to learn more about the Quintessons and their involvement with Cybertron through the Matrix. That's not even me being blunt, that's just what happens. Now, the only significant thing about this episode really is the huge history lesson we get of Cybertron's past. 
As Rodimus Prime enters the Matrix, he is greeted by ancient Autobot spirits that have previously held onto the Matrix. It's revealed that the Quinnessons used Cybertron as a factory for two types of robots, the consumer goods and the military hardware, which of course would become Decepticons and Autobots. The Quinnessons would be banished from Cybertron, but the war between the Autobots and Decepticons would rage on, with the Autobots learning the art of transformation, and then it goes into the origin story of Megatron and Optimus Prime. And you know, for Generation 1, it's a good origin story, but I'm glad that it's not been adapted in modern Transformers. I just never liked the idea of the Quinnessons being the creators. I feel like there's more to Cybertron than just that. Like, come on, there's more to Cybertron than just being a factory. But you know, I'm glad that this origin story does exist because then you can look at it and just think about how much you could expand on that idea. Anyway, Wheelie gets attacked by bats. The Constrictorcons build a city on Earth that transforms into Trypticon. Okay, how? How did they build this in such a short amount of time? Like, wow, okay. Episode 70, Five Faces of Darkness, Part 5. We made it! In this episode, we get introduced to some brand new characters such as Skylinks, Metroplex, and the Predacons, but we also get to see some old faces. As Optimus Prime used to say, transform and roll out! I'm sorry, who are you? But yeah, aw, it's good to see the arc again, especially with Teletran 1. It just reminds me of those good old days. Okay, now I'm gonna cry. So yes, I know this show is like a giant toy commercial, but this episode couldn't be more apparent. You know, we've got Skylinks with Predacons, and then we've got Metroplex with Trypticon. Christ, how can they be both strong and light? Okay, so I thought Earth in Season 2 was bad. Earth in Season 3, I am jumping right off this planet. I'm gonna go to Mars. This is chaotic. I am not staying here with them. Anyway, like I mentioned before, Blitzwing informs Galvatron about the Quinnison's plot against the Transformers, but like Galvatron fashion, he doesn't listen, and he pulls the switch that the Quinnison's wanted to pull, which causes all the Transformers to freeze. Gold, huh? They plum burned out. Well, no matter how newfangled you make them, when they bust, they bust. What the f are they talking about? Anyway, the Transformers are saved because of Spike. Yep, Spike saves the day. You know, the Quintessons were kind of worried about the humans, and you know, they probably should have paid much closer attention to that. So that was Five Faces of Darkness, and overall, not as bad as what I remember. It just feels like the whole plot is rushing itself. It's like Blur wrote this, you know, it just doesn't want to slow down. And it's like, ugh, it can be sometimes a headache. I'm not going to credit so much on its animation errors, because that's the entirety of G1, most specifically Season 3, because of the low budget, they wanted to be more cost effective when it came to the animation. And you can just tell right off the bat, like the dip in quality. Even though the quality wasn't that high to begin with. Episode 71, The Killing Jar. Um, I think someone forgot to make the bottom text bold. In this episode, Ultra Magnus, Cyclonus, Marissa Fairborn, and Retguard are captured by the Quinnison scientist for experiments, but they are sucked into a more dangerous problem, a black hole. Now you'll notice this episode looks better, that's because Sumbo are animating this episode, not Acom. And for whatever reason, they decided to give Unicron's head a glow up. So yeah, it's a very small cast, but that works in the episode's favour, because we get more time with Ultra Magnus and Cyclonus, who make for really good adversaries. Now they're both being tricked by a Quinnison scientist, who apparently is the one who contributed to the original Autobot design. And you know, I don't understand how Ultra Magnus could fall for the fake Rodimus and Skylinks, but with Cyclonus, yeah, I can understand how he fell for the fake Galvatron. <laughs> And we've got Retgar here watching the movie adaptation of Stephen King's It. Come and find Retgar and say hello to the studio audience! Christ, as a kid I would have been terrified. We also have a human character in this episode called Melissa Fairborn. Now she actually was in Five Faces of Darkness, but I didn't mention her because, well, she doesn't really do much. She's like part of a Space Force command, and you know, she's actually pretty cool. She does a lot more in this episode than she did in Five Faces of Darkness. Now, I'm not familiar with G.I. Joe, but they do a connection here with her family tree. 
At one point in the episode, they go through a negative universe with the black hole, and they all have different alternate colours, and like that's very Shattered Glass vibes. Eh, that was kind of neat. Ultra Magnus looks terrible though. They're Roadbuster colours, so I get the toy now in Transmiss Animated. But yeah, this episode was fine. It did a good job. I love Cyclonus's tiny little head. Episode 72, Chaos. The episode begins with this, oh, disgusting thing. I, oh my god, I hate looking at this every time. It's called a Strukside, and apparently it's an intelligent reptilian. Yeah, I bet. It looks like Ganon's deformed younger brother. I don't even know. That's what Cupper JJ said. You know this thing looks better like a girl, right? Like, why couldn't we have had this instead? I'm officially going to make it canon that this girl is his sister, and let's just leave it kind of unexplained where she gets her looks in the family. A discovery on Goo forces Cup to face a demon from his past. Basically, an obese swamp thing. And you know, it does a good job on expanding Cup's character. But we get a new character in this episode called Runamuck, who's usually partnered with his battle charger buddy Runabout, but we've got him partnered with Blastoff. I will say though, this episode was kind of annoying of how many questions Grimlock was asking. It's like, dude, shut up. Is that crystal cup where it come from? Me, Grimlock, say you tell now, are we glitch and short circuit? But Cup does eventually tell the story of him being a prisoner, and how when he escaped, he just left the prisoners by themselves. Like, it's been a hundred years, and you'd think at one point he would have sent a rescue team. Like, yeah, I know he's traumatized and all, but he didn't have to go. He could have just told people where to go and look for him. <laughs> really? You scared of this guy? But in this episode, he goes back, and he does rescue all the prisoners that he left behind, and finally forgives himself. Now, this episode was fine, it was alright. But to be fair, I want an episode based on the story Cook told at the end. There was Jonagar with me aboard, flying right into the mouth of this giant space whale, you see. For three days and nights, we was trapped inside that whale, and we thought we was done for. Give me that episode. <laughs> episode 73, Dark Awakening. Optimus Prime is revived as a zombie by the Quintessons. Sure. Because why not? Let's traumatize the kids just a little bit more. Now this episode is very dark, and I love it. But I can still understand why it was controversial at the time. Because you gotta bear in mind that this episode began production around the same time of the film's theatrical release, so Hasbro was still unaware about how the death of Optimus Prime would impact audiences. Now despite this being episode 8, they did actually re-air this episode to promote the broadcast of the return of Optimus Prime. I mean to what, to cover up their initial intent of killing Optimus Prime again? This alternate version is actually on YouTube on the Hasbro Pulse channel where you can watch these episodes for free. I mean, this episode is just chock full of memorable quotes and scenes. Monsters. They made me a weapon to destroy the very ones I loved in life. Like, damn, that's heartbreaking. Now, I could go deeper into this episode, but I'm going to give this to someone else who actually watched the episode when it was released. Yes, the first YouTuber I ever watched, so I'm happy to introduce P. All. Alright, hi, uh, this is P. All. I am doing Dark Awakening is the episode I chose for this, just because it was one of the ones that uh, is kind of important to some of the Autobot mythos and, and, and Rodimus becoming a leader. Um, right off the bat, you got Galvatron being crazy, talking to the Quintessons, and again... This is how Galvatron is different than Megatron because he's done with the Quintessons and he just shoots the computer. Oh yes, you are loyal allies, so long as it suits your purposes! That's a Starscream move. Megatron would have just turned the computer off and been like, ah, these fools, you know. They find each other in the middle of space and they all just happen to be right next to the Autobot Mausoleum, which is where all the Autobots go and it seems dead Autobots go. And that seems in and of itself like a bad idea. Just Let's just put all of our dead bodies in this thing and just, just fling it into space where we don't really know where it is. They act like they just kind of, oh god, I never thought I'd see that again, and yet they were flying right towards it. So <laughs> they're, they're flying out, the, the ship blows up, they pull the whole, they don't actually separate the front se section, but they launch an escape pod, Daniel and Spike are on it, and, da and Spike's all like, well, what do we do if we run out of air? And Rodimus is, uh... What do Daniel and I do when the air runs out? Well, basically, you'll have two choices, suffocate or smother very much a hot rod joke like i can hear hot rod being like well you'll suffocate or smother you know like and, it, and i just think that's a neat little personality of 
hot rod coming through in Rodimus there, even though it's a little bit of a, a dark joke, although the whole episode is a little bit of a dark joke. So they get into the mausoleum. I, I still think that veil was something that animators did, that writers added, and I'm like, well, that's the mystical veil, because it just seems weird, especially since only, like, Optimus is behind it. They said it's a tribute to all the people who die, but then, like, all the corpses are down some random hallway that Daniel finds, and only manages to find, like, Ironhide and Prowl. They say this is the mausoleum to all Autobots who died in the Great War, and I feel like over four million years, it would probably have a lot more unknowns, or at least uh, more corpses in it. I'm not dead. Oh, they, they find Optimus. He, he's up. He's running around. They're not sure what's going on. Um, which one? He clearly has Optimus in him. Like it's not just a we we zombified a corpse like the Quintessons, you know, chuckle over later in the episode when they're explaining their plan. Like he's clearly in there, which makes me think maybe you all. Maybe they shuffled Optimus Prime off into this space mausoleum a little before uh, they really needed to. But yeah, he, he's like, here, I built I, I, I built this escape ship. They never explicitly explain that he's built this ship out of corpses. There's definitely like some arms and some legs in there. So uh, you never see a face, but that's a little disturbing. But anyway, Prime goes back. They, uh, everybody else, Daniel and them, build another second corpse ship on the thing in like five minutes and escape, crash back into Cybertron. But when they're crashing back into Cybertron, and this is one of my favorite bits of the episode just because it features one of my favorite auto or Transformers, or I guess Autobots, technically Dinobots. Um, they're looking at the viewport and Snarl, like a little puppy dog in dinosaur mode, comes walking up to the windows like... <laughs> And then they, everybody gets off, and Sludge is like, wait, we're not going to listen to you. You're dead, because Prime had told them everybody had died. Um, and the, But then comes to, like, a surprisingly nihilistic realization for a Dinobot. Maybe we did. What are you yammering about? During the battle, so the Quintessons have lured the Autobots into this trap for using Optimus Prime's corpse. And I feel like there were a lot of different ways... Autobots in space, they could have lured the Autobots into this trap, but regardless, ensuing battle, they start blow. like I said, several aerial bots blow up. Power Glide appears to blow up in this episode, and I don't know if we see him again for the rest of the series or not, but uh, no uh, mention or uh, acknowledgement of Power Glide just exploding in space. Autobots get on the ship. Rodimus tells, or Hot Rod, I guess at this point, tells everybody else to find a way to turn the ship around. I'm going to go hunt Optimus, and they get into a big fight, and Rodimus finally steps up uh, gets into the command center and is like, I'm taking command. What took you so long? In the immediacy makes sense because Optimus Prime has clearly been locked in this corpse and is trying to fight it. Is is glad for that somebody has finally come to stop him from doing these horrible things to the people he cares about. But also it's, it's kind of a statement that... You know, like, hey, you finally stepping up and accepted that you can be the leader. Because that's kind of Rodimus' whole thing. It's like, I don't know. I don't know if I can live up to Optimus. For pretty much the entirety of his command. Everybody saves the day. Optimus, like, just suicide missions into this controller thing as you watch him just slowly blow apart as the ship gets bombarded with fire. I'm invincible! The Autobots go back home. And then the episode ends with a... But is this really the end of Optimus Prime? Find out in tomorrow's exciting episode, The Return of Optimus Prime. Well, I mean, you kind of just blew the lead there, buddy. Anyway. You know, Peel, if I watched this as a child, I'd probably be traumatized for life. So I just want to say I'm glad you've made it to adulthood. Thanks for letting me be a part of this. Um, I'm, this, was, this was fun. Like I said, it let me sit down and watch an episode I haven't sat down and watched in, in quite a while. So, uh... I appreciate the chance. I should really go back and watch more of it. Isn't he just the nicest guy in the world? Episode 74, Forever is a long time coming. The Quinnessons attempt to alter their own history by opening a time window to Cybertron's ancient past, but they meddle with it too much where it ultimately causes time itself to begin unraveling. So yeah, this episode's lame. I mean, I've just watched this episode and I can't really remember what happened. It's an ACOM episode. It's just visually ugly to look at. All right, uh, let's look at my notes. Um, Alpha Trion's mustache. Yeah, that's ugly. Please change it back, please. Ah, that's better. 
Okay, so the time loop is going around Cybertron and Earth, and it's like kind of repeating things, but then it's also reverting things. And we've got Marissa Fairborn, who we've seen in a few episodes now, just get revert back to a baby. Captain Fairborn? Don't tell me this is what led to Kiss players. Okay, I'm going to burn my eyes out now. We've also got Blaster's door opening sideways, and that just visually damages my brain. Also, Ramhorn is perhaps the ugliest cassette I've ever seen. So yeah, things in this episode just kind of happen, and you know, I wish they actually delved into a multiverse plot. I felt like that would have been way more interesting, and they kind of do it at the end. All right, you've convinced me. That's this! Hmm, genius. Hi, I'm Michael Bay, director of Hollywood hits such as Transformers. It's gotta be a trick! Episode 75, Starscream's Ghost. Yep, even in death, our boy is still scheming. We have a new character called Octane, and he is on the run from the Decepticons, and seeks an asylum on Cybertron, but unfortunately, he encounters the ghost of Starscream. Starscream! Like mentioned in Five Faces of Darkness, the original script for this episode was supposed to have featured Blitzwing and not Octane. Now, I would be more upset about this, but Octane is actually a really fun character. Despite it being so obvious that it was meant to be Blitzwing, I think it still worked in the episode's favour. I mean, come on, this is Hasbro, we've got to promote new toys. Now, this episode takes place technically after A Thief in the Night, but I'm going to let it slide because it's not that big of an error to switch the episodes around. They just revised the script just because of a Blitzwing change. And oh my god, I think I might have a heart attack. The Decepticon insignia is finally drawn correctly. Oh my god, this this is a miracle, and it only took us about five hours. Now this is one of my favourite episodes out of season three, just because I think it's been written so well. I feel like the Decepticon centred episodes are always at their best. It's a very comedic episode with a lot of great dialogue. Besides, he might have information about the Autobots. Yes, we shall interrogate him. Even if it's not informative, it will be fun. We get some insane moments in this episode, such as Octane tuning in to Roboporn. A little more here. Yeah, that's better. What's that? Don't watch porn, kids, or you'll die. We also have a new Autobot called Sandstorm in this episode who's also a triple changer. Octane asks Sandstorm to protect him, and you know these two have some really good banter. They missed me! That's because they weren't shooting at you! They're after me! Let's see! No two ways about it, you gotta do something about your popularity! So because Galvatron has put a bounty on his head, we've got the Sluxoid, the maggot looking creature, trying to kill him. And you know, he actually makes up for it in this episode on his constant failed attempts of trying to kill Octane. It actually makes for some good comedy. We get to Cybertron and while Octane is on the run, he actually ends up falling into a Decepticon crypt. And I love how he pays nod to Thundercracker, who is technically like one of the sweeps or whatever. And he goes over to Starscream's crypt and it's just legs. <laughs> You've got to love the Decepticon's dark sense of humour. Now as much as I love spooky stuff, i got a friend who loves spooky stuff just a little bit more. The lore expert, Emperor Kumquat. Starscream's Ghost was an episode I watched over and over as a kid, so I guess it's my favourite. As a kid I loved ghosts and Danny Phantom, so to see my favourite character be a ghost was really cool for me. I ignored most of the episode just to focus on the ghost parts, especially because I liked that Starscream came back after he was killed in the movie. Like, I didn't have to be sad about his death, knowing that he was going to return. Octane interests me back then too, because he was a Decepticon hanging around the Autobots, and while I didn't know why as a kid, I did like what I was seeing. As an adult, I'll add that I liked Octane for his surprisingly handsome lips. The episode got even better when Octane was chased into the crypt, and Starscream possessed Cyclonus. <laughs> He had to pretend to be Cyclonus, but he wasn't even that good at it, and his screechy Starscream voice was alerting people. Get out of the way! There seems to be something wrong with Cyclonus' voice. Yes, he sounds like Starscream! No need to be insulting! 
But yeah, one dude working with a ghost possessing someone's body. It was just fun for me as a kid. This episode also delivers on a lot of funny Galvatron scenes. Starscream and Octane team up with the Autobots in order to trap Galvatron, but somehow he manages to get out of that. The way how Galvatron comes back is just so funny to me. It's like he's been on a massacre and all the Autobots are now dead. So yeah, that was Starscream's ghost. A more creative way to bring back a dead character. And he'll be back, but this is definitely one of the best episodes out of season three. Episode 76. Thief in the Night. Octane steals Trypticon in an attempt to use him to control the Decepticons. And this episode takes place in the city of Carbomnia. Huh, that doesn't sound offensive at all. I'm shocked about the camels haven't rebelled. Yes, I've got to admit I'm not a fan of the stereotypes in this episode, and actually this isn't the first time we've been introduced to characters such as this. We had a bit of it in Season 2. And you know, stereotyping like this was pretty common in the 80s. It's not the only cartoon to do something like this. Isn't it dangerous to cruise near here? Yeah, sometimes innocent ships get attacked. There's no danger, I assure you. Wow, that lasted only two seconds. In fact, this episode is what caused voice actor Casey Kasem, who played Cliff Jumper, Blue Streak, Dr. Archieville, and Teletran 1, to quit the show because he took offence to the name Carbomnia, because if you couldn't tell, it's a stereotype. Along with other stereotypes in the show. Big one being the main human character in this episode, Abdul Fakadi. Uh, do you like gold? Gold? Yes, this is something that interests Abdul Fakadi. Who gets sick and tired of Trypticon and Octane taking all of their oil to make Energon. This episode is just Trypticon being a fat pig. Now, with Octane, you can tell this was supposed to be Blitzwing, same with Starscream's Ghost, and they switched it obviously because they wanted to promote the Octane toy, who is also a triple changer. But the thing is, this story just doesn't really work as Octane because we don't know who Octane is. What's his story? Why does he want to go against Galvatron and the Decepticons? Now the structure of this episode is overall broken, it's all over the place, but if they did have Blitzwing in Octane's role, at least you could look at the episode and kind of make sense of it. But anyway, to keep themselves in Carbomnia, ugh, even saying it is annoying, Octane and Trypticon steal a bunch of gold for Abdu Fakadi. But Galvatron finds out and he is pretty mad. Until Octane convinces him that the energon that they've gathered is actually much better. <laughs> Oh my god, I just thought about it. Imagine this guy drunk. Now, I know that realism isn't Transformers' strongest suit, but in this episode, Trypticon literally picks up monumental buildings from across the globe, like Paris and India, and hand delivers them to Abdu Fakadi to build his paradise nation. Now, who would have thought it would be that easy? Now, you'd think with Trypticon being a big guy, that the Autobots would know that he's stealing these big buildings because, well, he's out there in broad daylight. But no, they assume it's one of their own Dinobots doing it. It's like, why? I will admit though, this was pretty funny. We're gathered here, as you know, to figure out if any of you Dinobots was involved in stealing Fort Knox and the Taj Mahal. Why am I under investigation? I'm not a Dinobot. You got dinosaur electrons in your circuit, Skylinks. Nevertheless... Thankfully, it doesn't actually take him long to figure out it was Trypticon. Trypticon's the only Decepticon big enough to have carried off all those buildings. Gee, you think? And for some reason, all the countries around the world think it was the Autobots that stole all these buildings. You know, I'm done with this episode. I, I can't be asked with it. It is such a pain in the neck. Like, Trypticon throws a building at Metroplex. Watch out! That's a priceless treasure! The episode ends with the Autobots saving the day and, uh, yeah, this. Oh, you have my word of honor, Rodimus. In fact, I swear to you on the grave of my mother's camel, and my uncle's goat, and even my sister's donkeys. And did I say my brother's sheep and my nephew's roosters? Such fine roosters! Just stop. Episode 77, Surprise Party. Daniel and Wheelie team up to find out when it's Ultra Magnus' birthday. Aw, that's really sweet. But it's Daniel and Wheelie, so... <laughs> the episode actually begins with the Autobots throwing a surprise party for Daniel. And honestly, this is terrifying. Like, if they did this for me, I would be terrified. I would never trust the Autobots and my dad again. No, Daniel. Spike's so wise. Plan the surprise. 
Yeah, I'd shit myself. Anyway, this party only lasts two seconds because of a Combaticons attack. And you know, the Combaticons don't even need to form Boudicus anymore because he's just there, right next to them. Who, on God's name, when Ultra Magnus gets hurt by saving Wheelie's life, Wheelie and Daniel want to make it up to him by finding out when his birthday is so they can throw a surprise party. Why not just make the day he saved your life his birthday? Just saves a lot of time. And they head off to the archives and they come across this annoying robot. You want to know when Ultra Magnus was created? That's right, can you help us? Hmm, these three are now in competition on who's more annoying. The robot tells them that that information is probably more likely on an asteroid because of course it's gonna be. Anyway, they go there and they get attacked by more annoying robots. Come on out and show yourselves! Greetings, greetings, greetings. Honestly, I can't tell now who's more annoying. But the robots are destroyed by Cyclonus and for some reason Wheelie doesn't say anything. Huh? Come on, Wheelie! Really, I think we'd better get out of here. Yeah, just stay like that for the rest of the season. I love how when Ultra Magnus is talking to that archive robot on finding out where exactly Spike and Wheelie went, Ultra Magnus just doesn't care what the robot's saying, and even this episode doesn't care what he's saying. Oh, yes, 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 they were here all right. I gave them some information about the old... Yep, just carry on. We don't care. One thing that annoys me about this episode is the insignia transitions. They are just non-stop, like they must be at least 20. Anyway, Cyclonus takes Daniel in as a pet and the episode ends with the asteroid with all the Autobot archived information being destroyed and nobody cares. Really? Priceless pieces of information have now been gone and nobody cares? Say, I got an idea, guys. What's that? Why don't we just designate today as Ultra Magnus' birthday? What we really wanna know? Why we not think this up long ago? Happy birthday, Ultra! <sighs> I feel sorry for Ultra Magnus in this episode. He smiled once and has regretted it ever since. Episode 78, Madame's Paradise. A quick stroll through Cybertron leads Daniel and Grimlock to some place different. Please welcome to Cybertron, Inara, ambassador from the planet- Oh my god. Why does she look like she's made of moist? Oh hey, we get Carly in this episode. And we also find out Spike's last name, being Witwicky. This episode is overall fine. It's not good, but it's not great either. You'll notice that Grimlock has become more of a joke now. In season one, he was like this kingdom warrior. Now he's just wearing a tuxedo. Or an apron? Tux apron? I don't know, whatever. And you know what, I actually don't mind Grimlock in this kind of style of humour. I think it works. It worked in the movie, but season 3 sometimes can go a little bit too far with it. This episode is full of conveniences. By the way, how Daniel manages to find this underground place on Cybertron that somehow transports him to this fantasy world. Neat monster! Not monster, handsome like me, Grimlock. I think it's good that Grimlock can acknowledge another creature's beauty without people reading into it so deeply where it could be interpreted as something else. Unless, the teaming up of Daniel and Grimlock is much better than the last episode of Daniel and Wheelie. Where are we? Uh, not Cybertron. California, maybe? Wow, even California's not this weird. Isn't it, Daniel? Are you sure? Who are you? Okay, never mind. What the hell is that? Daniel! I can't find Daniel anywhere. He couldn't have gone far, Carly. Ah, I see you've learned absolutely nothing from the last episode, Ultra Magnus. Are you looking for your little spawn? I saw him leave with that Dinobot. Oh my god, stop talking. Get her face, get her moist face out of the way. Anyway, Spike and Grimlock meet this tentacle weird looking thing and decide to go off with him to the castle. I don't know. My mom says never to go off with strangers. Everybody here, stranger. Us not go with stranger. Us not go. Okay, okay. Atta boy, Grimlock. Keep teaching those important lessons to the kids watching at home. Anyway, the people of Mononia tell Grimlock and Daniel all about the history and honestly, I don't care. Like, right, yeah, this is boring. Please, can we move on? Anyway, Daniel gets captured by Woodmen, and the Autobots travel deep into Cybertron and touch the same dragon painting that transports them to Mononia, and Daniel breaks free with a creepy old man that he found in the same cellar, and go out to destroy a rock that releases a gold man who turns into a dragon. 
What the fuck am I so good? And Wizard Man yells at Grimlock. If Wizard's so strong, why he need me, Grimlock? Because his enemies are many. Like insects, they swarm and attack and attack and attack with raw force, primitive magic driven by hate, by envy. They will not stop. Uh, me, Grimlock, just wanted to know. <laughs> why is he yelling at him? Oh, I feel so bad for Grimlock. Okay, so the evil wizard turned out to be a Quinnison, so they defeat him using Blaster, and Grimlock doesn't understand anything. Dad, it was an accident, honest. Daniel tell truth. He not mean to get all dirty. <laughs> <laughs> What's so funny? Episode 79, Nightmare Planet. And in this episode, Galvatron finally kills Daniel. Oh, I'm so happy. No! Oh, for fu- Now, this episode is actually a nightmare, but if the story didn't tell you that, because we've seen so much bizarre imagery already in this series, you would have just assumed it's just another regular episode. Like, I don't know, I feel like the writer wants you to have a fun time with this episode. But I have a feeling we're not in it for a fun time. The only thing I really love about this episode is just the bizarre team up with Springer and one of the Predacons, Razor Claw. Like, they both hate the situation they're in, and I love it. Get on! Be careful, Springer! <laughs> Be careful, Springer! Now for this episode, I'm going to let my good friend Delzord explain why this is surprisingly one of his favourites. The reason why I like Nightmare Planet in Season 3 is because it's absolutely bonkers. The episode throws a ton of nonsense at you, but not without getting you thinking. This episode blurs the line between dream and reality. And although it's made evident that most things we are seeing are from Daniel's dream, this episode leaves the door open to interpretation. What's interesting about the episode is the amount of different characters we are introduced to. From the get-go we have a clown jumping out of a jack-in-the-box, a witch, and a giant mother trucking Galvatron. It's me, Headstrong. You uh, recognize me now. I'm on your side. You Later on in the episode, we have a dragon who captures Springer and Razorclaw, and a giant who manhandles Ultra Magnus and the Predacons, all of which are constructed as part of Daniel's supposed dreams, that have become nightmares. It turns out these nightmares are being created by the Quintessons, who are using Daniel's dreams to make characters who they hope will destroy the Autobots and Decepticons. This is an aspect I really like about the episode, as it shows how sneaky and manipulative the Quintessons can be, in an attempt to gain victory over the Transformers. My favourite character moment of the episode is a giant-sized Galvatron. The reason being, he's a giant-sized Galvatron. A few other things I find interesting about the episode is just how dark the Quintessons can be, as they openly discuss inflicting brain damage on Daniel by increasing the strength of his nightmares. The setting is too high, it might damage the human's brain. Never mind, as long as it keeps him from helping the Autobots, it will be worth it. Also, what's going on with Rodimus Prime's eyes? One minute they are Autobot Blue, the next they are Decepticon Red. One final interesting note about the episode is that apparently the Transformers deal in the currency of gold, which the princess attempts to negotiate with as part of being rescued. If there's anything to strongly dislike about Nightmare Planet, it's probably the princess. She's incredibly annoying. I'm afraid it's just temporary! The images are too overpowering for Danny to control! But I think the story behind Nightmare Planet, although bonkers, makes it a clever and very different episode. Episode 80, Ghost in the Machine. Starscream possesses Scourge and makes a deal with the devil, Unicron in the hopes to regain his physical body again. The episode doesn't waste any time and jumps straight into madness with Starscream possessing Scourge. Now you'd think from Starscream's ghost that Galvatron would remember when Cyclonus was possessed by Scourge, but then you'd also think that Cyclonus would remember him being possessed by Starscream. 
but unfortunately for poor Scourge, they think he's a traitor. Get out of here! Leave me alone! Not on your life! <laughs> Scourge, drop your weapon! There is no reasoning with him! Destroy him! He's lost his mind! <laughs> oh, I love him. I love Galvatron so much. So Scourge and Starscream head off to Unicron's head, and you'd think with it now being like a moon for Cybertron, that the Autobots would keep a closer eye on it, but they just fly in willy-nilly. Starscream and Unicron struck a deal that if he does three tasks for him, that he will grant him his new body. Now Unicron in Season 3 is being voiced by the late Roger C. Carmel, who does a really good job. Yes, Unicron can grant your request, but only after you have performed three labours. And kind of a sad fact to know, but as this episode aired on October 21st, 1986, Roger C. Kelmore passed away from heart failure just a month later. Such a shame. He does such a great performance of Unicron, and along with the other characters he voiced in the series, such as Motormaster and Bruticus. Okay, so the pacing of this episode is just nuts. It transitions from scene to scene so fast. It's really hard to kind of keep up with this episode. It's in a rush to actually finish. Like for the next scene on Autobot City, Cup is doing an inspection on Metroplex, and it's good to see all these old characters again, but we don't get a lot of time spent with them because the scene is in that much of a hurry to finish. Thank you, Cup. We take our duty here seriously. Uh. Our worlds are in danger. Blaster, that sure is some serious music. Miraculously, both Starscream and Scourge managed to infiltrate Metroplex's eyes without setting off any alarms. So, what was the point of the inspection? I guess it failed? But I suppose it was worth it just to see Spike and Bumblebee again teaming up, but why is Bumblebee so fat? The Volkswagen looks like a monster truck now. Anyway, Metroplex's eyes get stolen and he goes nuts. Well, I guess that kind of clears up why Astoria and Powerglide didn't last. Nah, to be fair, I can't really blame Warpath considering all the Season 1 and 2 characters are pretty much gone or dead, so he's clinging on to Powerglide because he's like one of the only few left. But sadly, this would be the last appearance of both Warpath and Powerglide. Now, I would explain the next scene, but I think Galvatron does it much better. First, you two, let Scourge and Starscream steal one of Trypticon's eyes. And then you two allowed Astro Train to be used as their escape vehicle. So Scourge is helping Starscream voluntarily. And you four were unable to stop them. Well, all I can say is... Unicron needs a transformation cog, so Starscream just steals Trypticon. Now, why couldn't he have just done that earlier? You know, for the strong, silent type, you sure talk too much. It's funny how Starscream has accomplished more by himself in just a few days than Galvatron has all season. Of course, the Autobots are the last to figure out what the plot is of this episode, and you know, with them being so concerned about Unicron being reactivated, why doesn't Rodimus just jump inside Unicron's head and open the Matrix once again? What? Is that recycled plot? Huh, the irony. Unicron wants Trypticon's transformation cog so that he can use Cybertron as his new body. Yeah, at least it'll be accurate to the toy now, I guess. Refusing to call AA, Starscream prepares to jumpstart Unicron. Complete the connection. <laughs> Do it yourself! I think at least one person has met a Starscream in their life. Starscream's new body is short-lived, however, when Galvatron blasts him, which sends him flying throughout space. Mighty Galvatron, what is that? It's Starscream! Blast him! But he's a ghost! Die, you worthless! You know, it's really poetic that Starscream's last scene in G1 is him screaming among the stars. So that was Starscream's Ghost, an overall fun and quirky episode, but the pacing is too fast for me. I wish there was at least one more episode with Starscream in it, but I feel like this was a fitting conclusion for the character. I mean, for those who wasn't happy about it, at least you got Beast Wars. <laughs> What's so funny, you moron? You! Where are the Autobots? <laughs> this is literally one of my favourite Galvatron moments ever. Episode 81, Web World. 
Cyclonus attempts to cure Galvatron's madness and takes him to a medical planet, Torculon, planet of the psychiatric apes. I can't really explain on why this is one of my favourite season 3 episodes. Now for this episode I'm going to summon one of the first internet personalities that I watched on YouTube. I'm happy to introduce Vangelis. Hey there G1ers, this is internet cameo personality Vangelis, and if there's one thing I love to talk about it's the Transformers Season 3, you know, the best season, the sci-fi one, the experimental showcase of young writers not yet knowing the pop-cultural juggernaut whose veins pumped hearty with their paycheck scripture. And while there are several post-movie episodes I love, Web World immediately jumped to mind as a highlight of the series. One of my favorite aspects of Season 3 is that it is, all proper nouns, the Season of Consequences. And for the Decepticons, theirs is the loss of Megatron, the lingering heralds of Unicron, and the fact that their god-born new leader is now a screaming shell of what he briefly had become. After an opening that teases the red herring of a classic Autobot Decepticon conflict, it is quickly revealed that our protagonist is actually Cyclonus! Doting over his unhinged commander and attempting to bellow a fist-shaking threat as the Autobots depart, even the sweeps can't keep up the act as the Decepticons are collectively realizing that their weakest link and greatest adversary on the battlefield is their own leader. Out of my way, fool! My Unicron, please! We must use strategy and... Strategy is cowards! A villain faction episode is not a common thing in classic toy commercial fare, and I adore how much Webworld shows us not only the growingly unstable state of the Decepticons and their leader, but also who Cyclonus is as a character at this point. Talking up the greatness of Galvatron while not even able to make Swindle flinch at gunpoint when the Combaticon literally states they'd be better off with their leader slain on the battlefield, Cyclonus is clearly intelligent enough to know something's up when Aquinason contacts him to offer some dubious help in the form of information about the psychiatric planet of Torculon, and yet, something must be done. On the other hand, something must be done. It's hard to pinpoint favorite parts of this episode, as I love it minute to minute. Galvatron's ridiculous acts of aggression, the straight-up disturbing nature of Torculon and its patience, the knowing bureaucracy of its overly calm wardens. Just say whatever comes to mind. Kill, smash, destroy! Uh, yes, go on. Rend! Mangle! Destroy! This episode, for 20-some minutes, makes you root for Cyclonus and fear for Galvatron. It shows you a greater evil than a purple toy with a pointy faction symbol, that being the cold and cruel horror of trying to help a loved one and watching them suffer under the knife of a system devoid of empathy. Yes, tell me about the Autobots. I hate the Autobots! I hate Cyclonus! Cyclonus is the Decepticon, second in command, carries a large laser gun, and can transform into a galaxy cruising space jet, and yet he is rendered silent and obedient, signing endless forms as a Torculi administrator ignores and speaks over his increasingly concerned questions. Watching Galvatron go through this darkly comedic parody of a healthcare system more interested in transaction than patient wellness is a simply fascinating interlude for a show like the Transformers of 1984 through 80, uh, whatever. And one wonders if this came from a place of knowing on the part of the writer, hearing Galvatron's manic rantings grow more desperate and even fearful while Cyclonus continues to stand by, constantly asking questions, wondering if his good intentions will lead to irrevocable consequences. When the Aliar deployed, revealing the deliciously hideous nature of Torculon itself, Cyclonus becomes the good son demanding the release of his loved one before an experimental treatment meant to complete the deterioration of a suffering mind can be executed. Galvatron bellows his threats, but eventually one of them ends with a painful and terrified, PLEASE! I'll do whatever you want! I'll do nothing at all! Galvatron! 
Cyclonus, there's a shiny. Help me! Oh, help me! All's well that ends well, though, as Torculon's hubris wreaks its own extermination. The living planet's attempt to devour Galvatron's mind backfires gloriously as it is overloaded by a madness derived from the creation of another, bigger living planet. And one can't help but cheer as Galvatron laser focuses on obliterating Torculon by literally shooting it in the brain before savaging its surface and populace, setting back the Torculi and their disturbing practice by centuries before Cyclonus manages to distract his leader by mentioning the Autobots once again. Haven't we more pressing concerns, mighty one? The Autobots, for instance. Autobots! Ultra Magnus! Yes! Yeah. Webworld encapsulates part of what makes Season 3 so great and is easily one of my top G1 episodes of all time. It also provides defined names for Galvatron's plasma bath neural damage. And as far as favorite little goofy moments and errors, there's a couple. You know, there's some classic non-vocoded Dr. Claw voice in the opening 90 seconds with Soundwave. Ratman has found a deposit of isodrite and something else. And the Torculi with the inhibitor ray gun is just always assuming a ridiculously intense pose before firing. Uh, and of course, I have no head, I have no head, I have no head, I have no head. Episode 82, Carnage in C Minor. Now this episode is notorious for being one of the worst and poorly animated episodes, but to be honest, I don't want to talk about it. I actually showed this episode to my friend Daniel, and I'll let his reaction speak for itself. Hi, recording my execution video. You don't even know anything about G1, do you, really? I don't know anything about most, most things. <laughs> and this is no different. Yeah, that is pretty honest. Honesty is the best policy. So this is regarded as one of the best episodes of Generation 1. Means nothing to me. You know him, don't you? Summit Wave. Yeah. Sound Wave, is that one? Yeah, this is Megatron, but Galvatron now. Oh, that one. So there's combiners which are bigger than regular Autobots, but there are some combiners in this episode that are the same size as regular Autobots. So, <laughs> devastated there. He's supposed to be way bigger, but he's small. I was that a salute? <laughs> that looks a bit dodgy. Oh, that looks weird. No, that looks very weird. <laughs> Everyone dies. <laughs> you took that out of context, that would look very weird. Also, if you're flying through space, isn't it supposed to be like uh, jet propulsion or something? I don't see anything coming out. Mm. Like, how are they flying in space? Yeah, isn't that a drug trip? This whole episode's an acid trip. Oh, that was right. <laughs> so much for the comet! What's that supposed to be? <laughs> so much for me! I'm leaving! It's meant to be a parody. <laughs> no. It reminds me of that, like, that shitty Legend of Zelda. Yeah, that's what I was, I was actually going to say. But I was. That's what it reminds me of. Yeah, that. I was going to say it just reminds me of that. When you said this was the best episode, do you mean that ironically or unironically? <laughs> or ironically. <laughs> <laughs> How? How did he do that? And then they are, they're back there again. Broadside, blaster, double dragon. That's the wrong size. <laughs> We've got to get to that alien. But they can fly anyway. Not, not Autobots, but he can. But weren't they all flying through space? Yeah, well, yeah, actually, yeah. Yeah, so... you got a point, yeah. <laughs> Look how he's suddenly smiling. <laughs> Aw, oh, they're holding hands. <laughs> so, that's why you should help us fight the Decepticons. Oh, so we're just gonna skip the whole speech, then. <laughs> <laughs> Great animation. I hate it. It's so long, but it's like, tw it's 20 minutes, but it feels longer. Yeah, it was probably more like two hours. <laughs> <laughs> I never get it. <laughs> the most beautiful sound in the world. I heard what you said. I can help you find Allegra. What did he say? He says. <laughs> hey, why could he understand it, but he can't? I can know it's stupid, but he's speaking English. Uh... Very impressive. Get out! 
as our ally, you can have the power. Very well. Stand by to receive the harmony. Well, she betrayed the people pretty quick. Yeah. Did you get the harmony? No. No! no. <laughs> Just picks him up. That Seabop, he has part of the secret. And he's probably with the Autobots. Fire! Well, you can see this with him. You literally stood over there. <laughs> Did they write the script first and animate it? Yeah, well, actually, um, it's a well known fact that they do the script and then four months later they animate it. Should have taken longer. Soundwave, he's singing a second part of the harmony. Get it! The massive f***ing headache. It sounds like it. <laughs> Much better! <laughs> What's the end game here? <laughs> Unconscious. She won't feel a thing. <laughs> I'll probably just cut that bit. Out. <laughs> I should rewrite that bit. <laughs> what the fuck was he doing? <laughs> he just died. <laughs> Looks like he's bound for the junkyard, not the repair shop. Oh, that was beautifully put. <laughs> Will you help us save our friends? Uh, yes or no? Okay. <laughs> Blaster, what happened? It's a long story, Perceptor. I'll tell you on the way back to Earth. Yeah, like you said, we just don't want to explain anything to the audience. <laughs> just deal with it. <laughs> Autobots! Impossible! Broadside! Possible, is it? You can't kind of be too expensive. <laughs> Just the button that says erase! Just grab his ass. <laughs> that seems like a big flaw in his design. Oh, Just yeah. erase his tape, press the button. So, very, 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 Daniel. That felt a lot longer. So, Daniel, how would you rank Carnage in C minor? Well, let's say you've never eaten food before, and I give you a plate of raw chicken and you eat it. You're thinking that tastes really bad. Like you've got nothing to compare it to. You just know it's bad yeah. by any standard. <laughs> <laughs> well, if that's the best I've got to offer, then I'm worried about the rest of it. <laughs> it's very goofy. All the letters. Was this just a special episode? It's <laughs> just immensely fucking confusing. Like who sat down and set wrote this and thought, yeah, did this make sense? This seems like a good idea. This took. This isn't annoying. <laughs> This bitch screeching in my fucking ears out. It's, a, it's the most, it's the worst rated for a reason. It seems like everything was a draft that they gave to a team of interns. Yeah. And they said, fuck it. Yeah, that's it. Episode 83, The Quintesson Journal. A Quintesson device may just be the key to peace between two worlds. The episode kicks off with one of the worst narrations I've ever heard. For centuries now, the planets Zetaxis and Lenark have been engaged in a senseless and brutal struggle. Can we get Casey Kasem back? You know, these aliens are disgusting. Can't we just kill them both? So for some reason, we have a flying tampon just travelling through space, and both Autobots and Decepticons pick up its signal, which leads to more combat. And nobody actually seems really interested in being part of this episode. Cyclonus is bored, Skylinks is bored, everybody's bored. This is Cyclonus, what news, Brother King? Oh, and for some reason Outback hasn't got any colour on his visor, and it's a recurring thing, it's throughout the whole episode. Remember who he is? He's the Australian one. You know, everything about this episode is just annoying. The Quintessons kidnap the Autobots, but they break free very quickly, because while well, the Shocktacons are literally the dumbest henchmen in existence. Well, these bars present a little problem, don't you think? Now, damn me, be glad to. Oh, finally, Galvatron shows up. I can at least somewhat enjoy a bit of this episode. But you said no mercy, Galvatron. Very true, so I will show none. 
You know, this episode has just lost me to continue talking about it any further when it's like, why would the Quinnisons just allow their journal to float through space? Well, at least I learnt one thing in this episode. This reminds me of your wrestling shows on Earth. At least those are faked, Rodimus. Wait, you're telling me WWE isn't real? Uh, this might be a good time for a break. Yeah, good and hurt. Seeing as how everybody's already left anyway. How much do you want to bet that's how you're feeling about this video? Now for episode 84, The Ultimate Weapon, I'll have my good friend Sam from TFI Creations explain why this is one of his personal favourites. God, I keep saying that wrong, don't I? These guys are all my friends, I, I promise. Hey, Cam. Season 3, The Ultimate Weapon. I absolutely love this episode, mainly because it has one of the biggest inspirations that I took for one of our works in TFI, and that is a one-armed defensor, because I love the Protector Bots to death. The Ultimate Weapon was my first experience with the Protector Bots, and especially First Aid. Because when I first got the First Aid figure, I had no idea that he was a pacifist. And watching this episode, just how calm and caring he is, and confused about war, just made him really, really unique to me. Because he's so innocent, and I absolutely love First Aid as a character. He, he's a huge influence on my own writing and stuff. So I loved him in this episode. Another key part I liked was earlier on in the episode, Ultra Magnus and Rodimus Prime, they're discussing, you know, leadership. You know, Rodimus states that, like, it's hard to live up to Optimus Prime, because we all know he was the greatest. I remember watching the 80s movie for the first time, and Optimus Prime dies, and that affected me in a certain way. I wasn't huge into Transformers when I first watched that film, but it was still impactful because everyone knows Optimus Prime. But definitely the highlight for me is the one-armed Defensor. When I first saw that, I don't know what it was, but it was just, it was a unique take on a combiner to have them be not fully there, but I do find it funny that um, Groove in combined mode, his motorcycle doubles in size. And true to their namesake, the Protector Bots, during this battle, they're still trying to save people at any chance. There's a, there's a part where uh, what, like a monorail train comes flying out of the sky and with one arm, Defensor catches it and kind of glides it back to the ground. Definitely love that. What I find quite interesting is I know a lot of uh, G1 episodes have a lot of animation errors. Reading up more on this episode, I come to find out that of all the episodes, this is one of the most uh, uh, finely tuned episodes that has the least amount of animation errors. Granted, there are a few, but they're not as prominent as episodes from the past. But yet, overall, The Ultimate Weapon is, is by far my favorite episode of G1, mainly because of the Protectobots and First Aid, Aerial Bots, you know, all of that. It's got everything I always loved about the Transformers, and yeah, I absolutely love it. Okay, but are we ever going to address the old woman with a gun? And also how Vortex knows something's up by smelling the exhaust? I detect the nauseating stench of Autobot fumes. So pure, so pollutant-free. Tell me the truth, human. <coughs> the truth, human, the truth! <coughs> Finally! Okay, so I know they're supposed to be undercover, but still, at the same time, I can't believe they just allowed him to fall out of a car. Like, why were you just watching that? Ultra Magnus saves him, yes, but still, it's like, okay, but they just didn't transform sooner? Really? I really like that this episode showed that there is no ultimate weapon. Like, we hear Megatron all the time throughout seasons one and two talk about the ultimate weapon, and it's like, what is it? What exactly is it? And this episode just delivers on nothing, really. It's just him saying it and just trying to scare the Autobots and then the Autobots finally conquer it where yeah you ain't got one because I use the real ultimate weapon my mind stay back I said stay back <laughs> episode 85 the big broadcast of 2006 the Quinnisons attempt to retrieve their lost records journal, so they use subliminal messages on the Junkions and inadvertently the entire galaxy. Telling the Junkions that being neat 
is a good thing and that the other racers are their enemies. Only problem is, they send out the wrong message. Causing the Junkions to believe that they should transmit their broadcasts to other racers and the affected racers soon begin lashing out on their neighbours. And all out war breaks loose. Is it just me, or am I finding these episodes much harder to watch? Now it's not outright stated, but this is essentially the same journal from the Quenison Journal episode. And you know what? I, I don't care. I do not care about this episode. It's just like the Quenison Journal. In fact, I don't know why, but it just felt like I was watching the same episode. Like, it, it felt like it was the exact same. Like, even the characters do not care about this episode, and I cannot fault them for that. The new hyper generator will restore power to the entire seventh grid sector. Hmm? I know you're bored, Rodimus, but with the mantle of leadership... Like, literally, I have the same amount of patience as Galvatron does in this scene, which is none. Fool! Do you think I care? Mighty one, if the Junkians have turned against the Autobots, perhaps... Perhaps, Cyclonus, I still would not care. Now I've got really nothing wrong with the Junkions, I just stopped caring for them after the movie, and, you know, yeah, it's good that we've got more screen time, but this episode's really trying to get me to care about them, and I just don't. I have said, have I not, that the Junkions are of no interest to me? Yes, Mighty One. I guess the only thing I really like is Retgard and Nancy, like their relationship, it's kind of fun, you know, they have some funny moments in this episode, but that's pretty much it, the rest of the Junkions are just, yeah, whatever. Quit arms out, kick high, be a winner, two, three, four. I'm a winner, I'm a winner. I believe in me. Also, randomly, we've just got Soundwave coming out of Blastoff. Yeah, overall, this episode is just a headache. There's too many lasers, too many explosions, just so much gunfire going off where it's just like, clutter. We've got another standoff fight between Rodimus Prime and Galvatron, and as usual, it's underwhelming. And the way how they stop the transmission is just Blaster doing his thing again, and they don't even care who was behind the whole thing. I wonder if we'll ever know who broadcast those mysterious programs. Personally, I don't care. Neither do f***ing I. <sighs> the television, it bewitched me. <laughs> Episode 86, Fight or Flee. The Decepticons conquer Paradon a world inhabited by pacifist Autobots. This ain't gonna go well. This is also the origin story of Sandstorm, even though he appeared in Starscream's Ghost. Yeah, this has happened before, let's just move on. And you know, this episode starts off pretty solid. We got a good action scene between Cyclonus, Scourge, and the Aerobots, and the animation is actually pretty consistently good throughout the whole episode. The fight ends because while Cyclonus and Scourge are surrounded and they take refuge in a vortex that they see, you know, it's kind of like seeing a black hole and going, yeah, let's hide in that. In doing this, they end up landing on Paradon, which is an Autobot colony initially hidden away from the wars that plagued Cybertron. Essentially, it's just paradise, it's just Cybertron as it should be. They're in such disbelief that they think it's like robot heaven. Welcome to Paradron, friends! You don't think this is what happens when you get deactivated, do you? Who knows, Gorge? Who knows? Oh my god, it must be. Please, send me there. I love this scene here of the Decepticons craving the Energon and Scourge just knocks that blue RC out of the way. <laughs> I don't know why that always gets me. You know, this episode actually delivers a lot of memorable quotes from both Scourge and Cyclonus, and they seem to really enjoy calling all of these Autobots wimps. I got the wrong idea, or are these guys a bunch of wimps? Yes, they appear to be wimps. The Decepticons manage to get back in touch with Galvatron, and whoa, hang on, that's actually a pretty cool design there. Out of all of the characters on this Paradon planet, this is the most unique looking design besides from Sandstorm. Give me a toy of that. Now this planet is debating on whether or not they should allow the Decepticons to stay because of the ruckus they've been causing. I mean, Paradise is swift up until the point you come across a Galvatron. Kneel to your new leader. But this is a democracy. I don't have to bow to anyone. Before a society can move forward, all must agree on the rules. Now kneel. Just imagine if Galvatron was president. Sandstorm is imprisoned but is able to escape, and the Decepticons try their best to chase him down, and... Bruticus is at normal size, and it's Cyclonus' voice. 
Yes, they literally forgot to draw the right character. Sandstorm manages to find the Autobots of Cybertron, and they are having a tough time believing that Paradon exists. Nobody believes it in this episode. Galvatron is already starting up his new Decepticon Empire, and well, <laughs> we've got this scene here. What do we have here? I believe it is an Autobot invasion party. I know what it is. Didn't you just ask me what we had here? It was just a figure of speech. G1 really does have a lot of sassy dialogues. This episode has an interesting theme to it, similar to the Golden Lagoon that goes beyond a kid show. War versus peace, but at what price? Do you fight or flee to defend what is yours? But that theme kind of deteriorates, so basically the Autobots are encountering heavy fire from the Decepticons, so their only plan to stop the Decepticons of conquering Paradon, this paradise, is to blow it up. No, Ultra Magnus, change mission. Blow the planet's energon core. That'll destroy the entire planet. I know, Sandstorm. He didn't even have to think about it. Like, really, dude? You couldn't have thought of any more ideas? Nah, this is all too extreme. Ultra Magnus will think of a better plan. I've never seen anything this beautiful in the entire galaxy. All right, give me the bomb. Okay, never mind, I've lost hope. That's Transformers in a nutshell. You know, I'm just stunned of how callous Rodimus is to just write off a whole planet and just like, yeah, let's just blow it up. And he doesn't want to fight, he doesn't want to put up a fight. He just gets everyone to retreat, millions of people having to evacuate in escape pods. I would say I'm being too hard on Rodimus here, but he says this. It's as beautiful in death as it was in life. Well, no need to get all mushy. Cybertron's a better place anyway. Not so... Perfect. Episode 87, The Dweller in the Depths. The Quenison's latest scheme to regain control of Cybertron is to unleash one of their oldest creations. Basically, this thing is Cthulhu. So we get new lore. In the distant past of Cybertron, the Quenison's created this thing. And, uh, well, they're going to use the Decepticons to unleash it. Kind of some interesting backstory there with the Quenisons and Cybertron, but it's this. Also, I'm pretty sure there's a continuity error in there somewhere. The Quenisons are too scared to release the beast themselves, so they trick Galvatron into doing it for them. <laughs> this is gonna be fun. You cringing, cowardly, weak will fools! Why am I still stuck on this worthless cosmic trash bin? Why have I not retaken Cybertron? And most importantly, why have I been saddled with such a useless pile of rusting junk for followers? But Galvatron, we humble sweeps need Energon to... And rightfully so, Galvatron does not trust the Quinnisons because they've betrayed him before in the past, but the Quinnisons actually make a compelling argument here. How can you be so certain we are the ones who betrayed you? Well, you all do look alike. Galvatron is a racist. Now the Autobots trail the Decepticons, but unfortunately Galvatron gets to the depths in time and unleashes chaos. And I gotta say, some of these weird designs are actually pretty cool. Very creative, it gives me like Final Fantasy vibes. These poor creatures look like they're in pain. And we got Octopus Primal here making his debut. The Decepticons retreat, leaving the Autobots to deal with the creatures on their own. But unfortunately, in the next room, Galvatron encounters Cthulhu. Now, this creature is brutal. Basically, to summarize it is... That thing drains robots of their power like some kind of vampire. <laughs> Thanks, RC. I mean, yeah, I was going to say that, but... Uh... Sorry, whose video is this? Everybody is basically almost dead in this episode. It's only Ultra Magnus and RC left on the Autobots team. Meanwhile, with the Decepticons, it's just Gomagol. Yeah, be a good soldier. Help him! Galvatron, no! I beg you! I just want to make it perfectly clear that I love all my friends and colleagues equally. So RC is able to hold back the creature by using Galvatron's own cannon. Now why couldn't Galvatron have just done that? So the way how they defeat the creature is just bizarre. So the Autobots and Decepticons who are infected have to hold hands. The power of science, I guess? So the Autobots are holding back the creature with the help of Optimus Prime. Okay, who did the colours on that? So the Autobots defeat the creature by using Perceptor's generator that was at the start of the episode. 
The Quintessons get a taste of their own medicine when they have to deal with the creature themselves, and I gotta say, this is a very fitting end. God, I absolutely hate looking at this thing, it makes me want to throw up. Episode 88, Only Human. The Autobots interfere with a crime-related business, so a powerful crime lord has their minds placed into symphoid bodies, with the help of a familiar old snake. War has changed. No, not that snake. <laughs> yes, that's right, this is our first real G.I. Joe crossover. It was just kind of hinted at before, but now we've got our real crossover. I don't know why they didn't take more of an advantage of this, because like I said earlier, like a G.I. Joe and Transformers crossover would have been actually pretty cool for the 80s. Like, I'm pretty sure that would have gotten a lot of viewing figures. The only time that the Transformers and G.I. Joe crossover is within the comics and toys. Now I don't care for G.I. Joe, but who knows, maybe a crossover would have done it for me. The episode begins with destruction, and Springer proves that he is terrible at saving people. You locked up, chum. The Autobots are in town. Now this is a good switch around from Season 2's Autobot Spike, where we had a human becoming an Autobot, and now we've got the Autobots becoming humans. And this concept would be adapted several times throughout the Transmus franchise, such as the two-parter in Transmus Animated called Human Error, but if that's not enough for you, then you can just go on Tumblr, and there's about billions of different kinds of fan fiction on there. Now, Transformers Animated's Human Error episode had to stretch it out to two parts, and honestly, I wish that this episode would have done the same. It's just so rushed. There's just so many ideas in this episode that are just half developed, and towards the end, the scene transitions just make it more apparent that it wants to finish. And I've always enjoyed the idea of the Transformers becoming humans when you see fan art of what their interpretations would be like. And I think for this episode, they do a pretty good job with Springer, RC, Rodimus, and Ultra Magnus. But for some reason, RC, despite her robot mode looking exactly like Princess Layla from Star Wars, her human form is completely different. She's even got a brand new hairstyle. And I just love the fact that human Rodimus and human Springer look exactly like their voice actors. We've got Dick Gutierrez and Neil Ross just the absolute spitting image, and yeah, Transformers Animated did the same with their voice cast, they just made them look like their respected voice actors. So the Autobots get lured into the laboratory, and as they are trapped, their minds get transferred in a newly created Synthoid human body, and it just looks like crap. Literally, it's just moulded from like crap or something. Apparently this is something that the Cobra would use on their old enemies for reasons, I, I don't know, I don't watch G.I. Joe, okay? With the robot bodies now empty, the Symphoid stuff gets thrown in the trash, and just before they become a pancake, they manage to escape. Rodimus goes full Terminator, and they enter a locker room where they find some clothes with colours that accurately match their robot forms. Because convenience. I gotta say, every time I watch this scene, it always makes me smile. You saved our lives, kid. Don't mention it, Gramps. Rodimus? What? In the name of Prime. I just love how sad Ultra Magnus is. Yeah, dude, same. I, I hate being a human too. It, it sucks. Wait, how have I only just thought about it? Where is the Matrix during this whole body switching? Is it still in the robot form or is it... I, I don't want to think about it. The Autobots split up, so Magnus and RC go back to contact Autobot City, while Rodimus and Springer go after Draft. But once they reach his house, Rodimus attempts to draw the guards away, but he is wounded and he is given refuge by Draft's girlfriend, Michelle. Now, Michelle, this bitch, her motivations are bizarre. So at first she's upset that the Autobots are supposedly killed by Draft, but then later she saves Rodimus, yet later she happily turns him over to Draft. So it's like, was she actually attracted to him and she changed her mind, or was she just learn him in a trap all this time? Because if she was working with Draft from the start, why didn't she let Rodimus get captured here? And there's only one explanation for it. She wanted to bone Rodimus. Yes, I know this is a kid's show, but I mean, look at this scene here. We don't often get prowlers around here, let alone good looking ones. What's this? It's called breakfast, dummy. Hmm, smells better than it tastes. Did you enjoy your sojourn, Rodimus? Maybe a little too much, Perceptor. Who knows, probably not. These moments were supposed to be the indication. Regardless, it wouldn't have made the episode any more interesting. I love this little scene here with Springer and some random seller on the street, and this is one of the few Transformers quotes 
I tend to repeat quite frequently. The path to true humanity, only 495 tax deductible. Sorry, pal, I'm a robot at heart. Anyway, later on, Springer ends up riding himself. Hang on a minute. I knew exactly what I was going to say there, yet I said it anyway. Okay, Springer flies himself. Is that better? No? Okay, whatever. Ultra Magnus threatens himself, and then RC kind of rides herself or her modern future alt mode. Oh god, this is bad. Anyway, the Autobots find out that they've been turned into humans, so they do a reverse and it's all good. Everyone gets arrested, but the Cobra guy, he goes off into the sunset. You know, I would like to see the Decepticons turn into humans. I feel like that would be an interesting episode. Essentially, Starscream is Cobra in human form. But whatever, this episode was just an experiment to answer Bumblebee's question from Season 2, and it's a pretty mild episode at best. <laughs> episode 89, Grimlock's New Brain. On Cybertron, the Autobots unveil the new generator, and who better to pull the switch to activate it? Throw the switch, Grimlock! Me Grimlock ready, but forgot which button. I went through it with him five times. And five times wasn't enough for you, Ronimus, to take a hint? I can't believe it! Grimlock! In this episode, Grimlock gains tremendous intelligence and creates the Technobots. And when combined, they form Computron. Unfortunately, the episode sees the return of, um, the most hideous creatures to grace the Transformers cartoon. Okay, so the journey on how Grimlock gets this new intelligence. Uh, so the new generator is causing all the Autobots to malfunction. So they go down to try and fix it. And this is what I was talking about earlier on in Season 2. Like, the Dinobots just become a joke. But most specifically, Grimlock. Like, he used to be this warrior, and now he's just become slapstick. No, you think me Grimlock just stupid? You no want me anymore. Now, I'm not going to complain too much because while I think this Grimlock is funny, you know, Greg Berger does a great job at delivering the lines, he works for both the serious and the comedic relief. I just kind of wish there was a bit more of a balance to it instead of it just being kind of just thrown in there. Now, Cup is babysitting Grimlock, but they actually stumble into the core, and then Grimlock, being Grimlock, destroys the generator with his teeth, and in doing this, causes an electrical surge, and he is granted a brand new brain. Grimlock is smart now. Hi, Grimlock! <coughs> Used my rear molars. Uh, that makes good sense. Good going. You what? We now have a T-Rex with vocabulary. And you know what? I really like it. This is where the episode really starts to shine, is when we get smart Grimlock. And I think the dialogue is actually really funny. Which makes it one of the most memorable episodes of Season 3, and kind of one of the funniest. It did kind of make me sad though when Grimlock rejected to get into the pond with the other Dinobots. And what's wrong with Snarl? He looks like a worm. Listen, Galvatron, you creepo! I did what you asked! And wow, I'm surprised that he's still alive after saying that. So with Galvatron's plans ruined, the ugly maggots tell him that if he wants more anti-electrons, he can get them from Unicron's brain. And honestly, I'm shocked you can get anything from Unicron at this point, because he looks like he's had way too many. You know, with the Decepticons nowadays, it feels like Galvatron's got his own little pet shop. We have a new character highlighted in this episode called Hunger. Yes, literally, from the song Hunger, from the 1986 movie, how on the nose can you be? Well, the Autobots head over to defeat the Decepticons, and Rodimus once again proves how utterly useless he is as a leader, and it's too much for Grimlock, where he's like, nah mate, I'm out, I've had enough of this shit. Why did they have to animate it like that though, where Rodimus is like, please don't go, help, I'm slowly getting murdered. Like I mentioned at the start of this episode, yes, Grimlock creates the Technobots, a new combiner, and he starts off with Nose Cone with just a box of scraps just laying around, and he's literally created within a transition. Yes, let's just not show the process, we don't need to see it, let's just say it just happened, because Grimlock is smart now, he can create life like that. Are you my father? In a way. It's funny and sad that his whole existence is just so that Grimlock could drill through a wall. Cyclonus and Scourge manage to piss off Unicron, and just out of nowhere, we have the entire Technobots just built. No explanation, 
And here's my theory. I think they accidentally swapped the Unicron attacking scene with the introduction scene of all the Technobots, because it just makes more sense to introduce them first, and then the Cyclonus and Scourge scene happens where Unicron starts attacking and, you know, they're first in action. And it's just like, yeah, that's got to be it. We've got new characters such as Strafe, Afterburn, Lightspeed, and Scattershot. And I gotta admit, Computron is not my favourite combiner. Who knows, maybe it was MatPat's fault for staining the character in the Prime Wars trilogy. Statement, past falsehoods indicate probable current dishonesty. Is that my excuse? Yeah, I think I'm gonna go with that. The only one out of the Technobots I really like is Scattershot, and that's just because I played as him all the time in Transfer's War for Cybertron in the Escalation. The episode's ending is very rushed. We have a combiner fight that if you blink, you'll miss it. Grimlock gives up his intelligence to aid Computron in the fight against Abominus. Oh, another combiner formed by the Terracons, which is Galvatron's little pet shop group we were talking about earlier. The day is saved and Grimlock is back in the pond with the other Dinobots hunting for fish. Me, Grimlock, say no fun to be genius all of time. Much more better to be good old Dinobot Grimlock. Yay, you're dumb again. Also, this is Cosmos' last appearance. Episode 90, Money is Everything. Marissa Fairborn and the Technobots are drawn into a Quintesson deal when they meet Dick Manus. Oh wait, sorry. Uh, Dirk Manus. Now this is the only episode in Season 3 where none of the major characters appear, like Rodimus Prime, Galvatron, Ultra Magnus, Cyclonus, etc. It's just focusing on the Technobots, and each character gets a moment to shine, which, you know, I think is a really good thing, because their origin episodes didn't do him any favours. And like mentioned before, we have a returning character, Marissa Fairborn. And she's got a lot more to do in this episode, considering the last time we saw her, she turned into a baby. Well, <laughs> she's grown up a lot since then, and... Um, <laughs> I don't know how to keep a straight face. And she has an unfortunate love interest with this scoundrel. Hello there. Dirk Manis, free trader from Epsilon Ariadne. Just another odd human custom, I suppose. <laughs> no one touches my Marissa and gets away with it. He's working with the Quinnesons, but he gets shot down by some Decepticons, and the Technobots are there to save the day, and he offers them a deal that if they pay his fee, he'll give up the Quinnesons. The Technobots form Computron to decipher whether or not they can trust him or not. Apparently this is something that they can do. How long are they going to keep that up? Till they decide whether to trust you. In Computron mode, Technobots have the computational ability of 200 supercomputers. When it comes to calculating odds, Computron rarely makes a mistake. I don't care what Computron says. Until we leave for Saturn, I'm not letting you out of my sight. 200 supercomputers can't beat a woman's instinct. Now when it comes to this dick, I gotta say, at first he seems like another Oggy, you know, that character from season 2, but over the course of the episode he kinda grows on you, and his banter between Marissa is actually quite comical, despite the situation being incredibly toxic. So his situation is that he has a device that the Quinnesons want, called the Recreator, which basically just disassembles and then also can reassemble the victims. But the Quinnesons con him with fake money, but then he cons them by putting a bomb on the device if anything goes wrong, but then they con him again before he can blow up the device as they blow up his ship, called Lazy Sue, and no one attacks Lazy Sue like that. So he teams up with the Technobots and reunites with Marissa, who is very pissed at him. You're fantastic. Yes, so are you, Dirk. <laughs> what was that for? Want a list? Ooh, that reminds me of a love both me and my girlfriend share. <laughs> but this is short-lived when he cons Marissa and the Technobots again, but he only does this so in turn that he can con the Quinnesons by using the Disassembler to repair the Technobots. Honestly, you could have just told him the plan from the start, so I don't know why this guy has to be such a dick. Anyway, we get a combined fight between Computron and Abominus. And I gotta say, Computron's strategy on calculating the odds before every attack is extremely flawed. Angle of fire, 14 degrees off center. Calculating return fire pattern. Well, at least he was fighting Abominus, because I think any other combiner he would have lost. <laughs> Calculated force necessary to activate Terracon timer mechanism, 16 megahertz. Okay, he's giving me a headache now, let's move on. I like how this episode ends, so Melissa ends up actually conning Dick, and they both have a little laugh off. And you know what? This is actually quite a funny end. Fun fact, a married couple wrote this episode, both Carla and Jerry Conway. 
Hmm, I wonder if any of this was inspired from their own romance. I kinda hope not. Episode 91, Call of the Primitives. In this episode, the Transformers go full anime. Well, that escalated quickly. Seriously though, this has some of the best animation I've seen throughout the entire series. So in this episode, a monkey creates Unicron's little brother, Tormatron. That doesn't sound real, it's so stupid. Grow one in a John. You are more than I could have hoped for, Tormatron. Much more. <laughs> What the fuck is this piece of shit? You know, I just want to talk about the animation style. It's just drop dead gorgeous in every shot. And you know, if the entire series was animated just like this, in this kind of manga anime style, I feel like most people would have had a different outlook on G1. But I can't fault the fans for wanting episodes to be more in this style. It really sets the bar high, even though the bar was not that very high to begin with. I'm a sucker for over-stylized character models, you know, when you got Rodimus just looking the way he does, he just looks so much more pointier. Well, I mean, all the characters do, they've all got a certain sharpness to him that I just go, wow. Like, I'm not kidding, I was too focused on the animation and I completely forgot what the plot was about. Okay, so a glowing rock called the Oracle created Unicron with the help of a monkey called Primacron. So the Oracle summons all the primitive Transformers to gang together to defeat the monkey's latest creation, Tormatron. He's described as Unicron's little brother. And he's causing havoc, so the Oracle wants him to be stopped because he's making everything grey. We've got grey Transformers, we've got grey Earth, everyone's grey. Now the plot of this episode is very forgettable, and that's a good thing because I don't like the idea of a monkey and a glowing rock being responsible for the creation of Unicron. Now the only thing really fun about this episode is watching the Beast Transformers try and get along, you know, and Skylinks automatically makes himself the leader of the group. There's some good comedy moments here. The way how this episode ends is just stupid. Primacron, who creates all these, like, giant beings, does not know how to defeat Tormatron. He says he's thought of everything, and Grimlock's just there like... Me, Grimlock, solve problem. Do not smart primitive like me. Me, Grimlock, think I did right thing. Grimlock just saved the whole universe with a switch. I'm just trying to process that. I hate this thing. The scrotum deserves it. And somehow this ends up being the last appearance of both Jazz and my boy, Windcharger. There he is. He's just there in the background. Someone on the team must have been a Windcharger fan to just put him in the background like that just randomly. Episode 92, The Face of Najika. The Autobots discover a race of aliens who have also experienced persecution from the Quintessons. Yes, I know, another Quintesson episode. So they're after a quadrant lock, which is capable of sealing off like regions of space. They sealed off a planet called Zumojin. The Quintessons feared the natives because of their telepathical abilities, so they sealed them off to stop them from evolving further. But it's not just the Quintessons after the lock, so is Galvatron. And I wish we had more of him in this episode because he's just, oh, he's just hilarious. Mighty Galvatron, please, we are in danger of... You shall learn the secret of this disc, or die trying! Blur is also in this episode. Yay, Blur. Peculiar, peculiar, what's peculiar? Where, where, where? So far this trip has been boring, boring, boring! It's about time we saw something peculiar, heard something peculiar, even smelled something peculiar! Put yourself in idle, Blur. Spoiler alert, he doesn't stay in idle. Also, something I thought I'd never see, the Autobots flying out of Skylinx's mouth. That's disgusting. 
Okay, so in order to stop the Autobots, the Quintessons decide to just trap the Autobots into the lock, but they accidentally get pulled in themselves, and so does Cyclonus because Galvatron just chucks him in. The Quintessons try to get out of it, but their isolator key is broken, and the only thing that can get them out is Preceptor, because he has a universal emulator, or whatever. Anyway, he gets trapped in his microscope mode, and is kidnapped by some dude, and his insignia is removed, and is placed on a faceless Najika. The face of Najika. Oh hey look, it's Windblade's little sister. No, I'm serious. An impressive display, Katsudan. Nijika, you speak. Per this unit's design specifications, yes. Does this surprise you? You know, the only thing creepy about it is that she's using Perceptor's voice. No, wait. Oh, <laughs> I just realized. Perceptor's consciousness is inside of her. Okay, so Perceptor ends up in a tiny alien Asian robot. Well, it's not every day that Perceptor gets to show his inner feminine side. And for some reason, they were terrified your people would reach the stars. Okay, so he doesn't have to hold it like that, but he does anyway. Take me to the city. Wait a minute, I didn't realise how small he was. Okay, so on to the other Autobots. Uh, they are carrying Blur, who was injured during their fall to the planet, and he is not happy. You can tell Blur's mad when he starts speaking slowly. Get us out of here! Wham, zip, into car mode, zoom, fush, gone, we we'll never have to think about it! Oh, oh. Go find Perceptor. You fix him, maybe he can fix me! He tells them to leave him behind, and immediately after that, he gets captured by a tribe. And Ultra Magnus and Rodimus encounter the same tribe later on, and it doesn't take long for Rodimus to want to blow up another planet. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. How about we blow this popsicle stand? The sooner, the better. And then, I'll just wipe New York off the fucking map. Well, one thing I don't get when it comes to the people of this planet is their logic to execute Blur, because while they think he's a devil of the servant Quintessons, and they remember what the Quintessons look like because they've got a stick with their face on it, yet the Quintessons are right there in the crowd with Cyclonus watching Blur's execution. Like, how did they not notice? I gotta love what Cyclonus says here, though. Burn him now! Be silent! Don't call attention to us! Vengeance now! Anyway, yeah, the day is saved, uh, they get their stars back, Perceptor has to hang up the dress, and actually this is Perceptor's last episode, so I guess this is like a good last episode for him. Memoirs of a tiny alien robot geisha with a male alien robot's transplanted brain. He really has come a long way, now that's character development. I don't really know how to end this off, so here's an uncomfortable clip of Blur really enjoying the molten pit. Episode 93, The Burden Hardest to Bear. In this episode, Rodimus Prime doesn't want to be the leader anymore, so Scourge takes the Matrix, and Galvatron loses his shit. Only Galvatron leads. I will not rest until the Matrix and Scourge have been destroyed! Now it's time to introduce another Transmers YouTuber who grew up with this episode as a kid, and who better than the Jesus-loving geek himself, Rodimus Primal. Hey everyone, it's Rodimus Primal. Cam asked me to talk about my favorite G1 cartoon episode, and that really is a hard one, because I there's a lot. A lot of people overlook a lot of the episodes in Season 3. Which one is my favorite? I have to probably go with the burden hardest to bear. And I think it's one that really reaches me on a personal level, on you know the first of all the character of Rodimus Prime which is this, that episode alone just can you know really make me see that character in such a positive light despite his his shortcomings and and things that he's had going on you know you have Rodimus Prime at the beginning of the the episode is leading the Autobots to in the defense of Japan where the Decepticons are attacking and he wins he's able to you know you have you get to see some 
Uh, your old uh, G1 favorites, you get to see Devastator and Freda King fighting Broadside. You get to see Skylynx riding in with Rodimus Prime and Cup against Cyclonus and the Sweeps. You get to see Defensor fighting against Bruticus, which is, is great as well. But despite all of this, Rodimus Prime has to deal with, well, the fact that even though he is successful in what he's doing, people just don't see it. You know, uh, the people of Japan sit there and they, they give him an earful uh, because the Decepticons attack and it scared away business and people are are, uh, are terrified of the Transformers fighting. But here Rodimus Prime is like, Hey, I am well aware of the damage that's been done, but we stopped the Decepticons from... This is very bad for business. You frighten locals and scare tourists away. Yeah, then maybe you ought to try protecting yourselves. Your presence and the presence of others like you does endanger us. And so Rodimus Prime is, has that that burden on his shoulders. And he's like, I just, I gotta get away. Give me a break, will you? Since when am I the only one who can solve everybody's problems? But, but you... Just leave me alone! <laughs> and then the Decepticons end up stealing the Matrix from him. Uh, bringing it back to Char, where Galvatron like is like wants to play with it. And he's like, "You dropped it, didn't you? You broke the Matrix, didn't you?" Return the Matrix! I will! I will! Scourge, take this and destroy it! But mighty Galvatron, you agreed to return it. I lied. But Hot Rod is. Left earlier in the episode, there is a, I believe it's, you know, a kendo instructor is, is teaching his students when the Decepticons had attacked. And uh, so Hot Rod basically hangs out there. Doesn't want to be leader anymore. He doesn't want to be Rod of his prime anymore. And uh, so, so Scourge launches an attack, you know, after usurping Galvatron to attack the Earth and attack Japan. So while this is happening, you know, Hot Rod wa witnesses a lesson that the kendo structure instructor is given to a young student who you know loses his footing and is like what were you thinking oh i was thinking i didn't want to lose and it's like well you don't think about anything what do you mean don't think about anything think about that like just do what you're supposed to do what one is obliged to do and hot rod comes to that realization when he sees scourge attacking and he sees how much the matrix has mutated him and also the young student is also there instrumental in helping, you know, Hot Rod. You know, so then Hot Rod ends up stealing the, you know, ends up taking the Matrix back, becoming Rodimus Prime again before Scourge has to face Galvatron. Scourge! Mighty Galvatron! Oh, no! Galvatron! You don't understand! Understand what? It wasn't my fault! It was the Matrix! The Matrix! And this too is the fault of the Matrix! At the end of the episode, the best lesson there was it's not just the Matrix, it's I've also regained that part of myself. And I think about that, about that particular line in the episode towards the end where he finally realizes, like, I must take on my responsibilities. Well, son of a gun, found that missing part, huh? Not just the Matrix Cup, a missing part of myself. I've had a lot of experiences happen in my in my life. You know, I worked in, in corporate, uh, you know, businesses before and had to deal with that leadership and wanted to quit. And here I am, I'm a father and a husband, and I need to make sure that my family is taken care of and I have that burden of responsibility, and sometimes I wish I can go back to the days when I was like in my early 20s. How do you feel, Roddy? Strong enough to go after him? I'm still me, you're still you. Matrix, Matrix. Hot Rod, listen to what you're saying. I know exactly what I'm saying. Life is not that simple. Life ha gives you a lot of challenges, but you need to keep moving forward. And what you are you know, obliged to do, you need to step up and do it. And you can do it. And it's not too late. And you can succeed. And that is why Burden Hardest the Bear resonates for me as my favorite G1 cartoon episode. So, thank you. Episode 94, The Return of Optimus Prime Part 1. I've done it! Optimus Prime lives! It's true. Our leader is back. Yes, Skylynx. And 
this time, no fear. Wait, didn't he die? Like twice? So yeah, basically this entire episode is a massive continuity error. Because you know, last time we saw him, he blew up. He didn't have an arm, and he was missing half of his face. And did I forget to mention he blew up? Yet in this new episode, Octopus Prime is shown completely intact, albeit dead, but still. Someone fixed Prime's body, but no one can fix the story. But who cares, okay? The kids are happy, Optimus Prime is back. So tell us, Hasbro, what's your genius plot? How are you going to bring back Optimus Prime? So two scientists that are bitter about the Autobots use the body of Optimus Prime to unleash a dangerous plague on the Autobots and ultimately the universe. Really? Okay. So we have brand new human characters in this episode. Jessica, Gregory, and Mark. It's unfortunate that we didn't get human characters that Prime knew from the beginning like Spike and Carly and heck, even Chip Chase. So while on a deep space mission, both Gregory and Jessica come across a ship carrying Optimus Prime. They both recognize their former Autobot leader, especially Gregory, who has reservations on saving him because he reflects on a memory where he was previously scarred during a battle between Optimus Prime and Megatron. Prime did this to me. This is his fault. Something tells me I'm not really gonna like Gregory. Oh. Lousy robot. Oh, way to go. Hit them when they're down. We need to kill Gregory. Okay, so Optimus Prime's ship is on a collision course with a plantoid orbiting star, so they go and rescue him. After successfully checking if Optimus Prime has athlete's foot, they watch the ship collide, which sets the whole thing into a supernova, but their ship gets unfortunately covered with some weird spores. So when they return to Earth, Jessica's father, Mark, tests out the spores on these innocent creatures and it's like, wow dude, what did the mice ever do to you, you dick? And conveniently, just as they learn that the spores are incredibly contagious, the Decepticons attack. Jessica is injured after saving her father and the Autobots are desperately trying their best to save her. Get away from her, you killers! Don't touch her! Leave my daughter alone! Get away, I said! I can do this! Um, dude, the Autobots are trying to help her? The ambulance! It's one of them! They're taking away Jessica! Oh, I hate them, Gregory! I hate them all! Um, okay. Okay, so these two arseholes come up with a plan to infect the other Autobots by using Prime's body. Even though they saved his daughter's life with an exoskeleton. Wait, nobody tell Chip. Yes, so the Autobots provide Jessica with an exoskeleton so she can walk again, but the father is in a bit of rage about this, and to be fair, I kinda get him. If they had a Decepticon in a hospital where my daughter was at, I'd be pretty mad too. Jesse, what have these monsters done to you? Dad, I can walk! They're destroying you like they destroy everything else. No, we just want to help! They timed that so right with the exoskeleton and the music in the background. Okay, so the experiment to use Optimus Prime failed, so they're just going to burn his body instead to use his metal. It's just some things that they say and do with Optimus Prime in this episode. Like, I can't imagine kids watching this and enjoying it because they keep teasing Optimus Prime dying, even though this is his return. So yeah, so this new trio, it just reminds me of the bot kids. They're just eerily similar to each other. So Jessica saves Optimus Prime from becoming a crisp, and now I'm conflicted if I want to be buried or cremated, because this right here is not giving me a lot of confidence to be cremated, because look how Optimus Prime just comes out of there. So Jessica's father, Mark, wants to use her as bait to lure the Autobots in, but she just goes against her father's wishes anyway and just tells them what he's planning. Why do I keep seeing you in my dreams, Optimus? Maybe because there's a giant-ass statue of Optimus Prime right there. Also, I'm pretty sure it wasn't that fat. Okay, so we've got Rodimus Prime once again questioning his leadership status, but I actually really like this scene. Like, the way how he talks, like, when he finds out that there's a chance that Octopus Prime might still be alive, he gets all the Autobots together, rallies them all together to charge to go rescue him, and it's just really cool. Like, the music really helps, and we get all the characters, like, and Bumblebee even is there. Like, the stakes are high, and it's just really epic. Okay, so we get some new characters introduced called the Throttlebots. And they're alright, they're cool, they're just kind of background fodder really, they don't really do much. You know, I've always kind of looked at them as sort of like the Power Rangers of the Transformers. You kind of wish they just get a bit more screen time really. The Autobots find Optimus Prime in the lab, but he's pretty wasted. Optimus. I remember. 
remember the time on Cybertron. Anyway, the Autobots get infected, all hell breaks loose, and oh, also the Decepticons show up at last minute, and they also get infected, and it's just madness and chaos. The Autobots are acting like madmen! It's a madness plague, Galvatron! If one of those Transformers touches you, you're infected! You're lying! Fine, whatever makes you a happy Decepticon. Just watch your rear thrusters. They've all gone mad! This is no place for me! <laughs> the irony in that line. Oh, the humans get infected as well, and it's pretty much the end of the world. And this moment right here would lead into the highly acclaimed spin-off series. The hate plague, as it's become known, is spreading like wildfire across our world. It began with infected Transformers. Okay, so with the hate plague spreading across the entire planet, Rodimus thinks it's more important to bring back Optimus Prime. His engines, they cannot take the strain. Rekgar, any hope that Junkions can repair him? He's dead, Jim. <laughs> okay. Rodimus orders Skylinks to find a Quinnison because he concludes that, well, if the Quinnisons brought Optimus Prime back before, then they can do the same again. Even though it was Alpha Trion who built Optimus Prime from Orion Pax, yes, the Quinnisons created the Transformers race, but weren't they driven off Cybertron way before? Uh, it's, okay, who cares, whatever. We've just got the Quinnisons for some reason running away from Shocktacons who are infected, but wait, isn't the plague only on Earth? Why is it on the planet the Quinnisons are on? It, how did it spread that fast? Okay, there's so many questions here. I, I'm, I'm losing my train of thought each second I carry on talking. Anyway, after this, Rodimus Prime decides to shut down Metroplex because he realizes that if he gets infected, then we're all screwed. Anyway, things escalate, Rekgar gets infected, and then, unfortunately, so does Rodimus. And when all seems lost, the Quinnisons successfully manage to bring back Optimus Prime, and yes, this is the moment we've all been waiting for. Um, excuse me, what the actual fuck are you doing in my house? Prime is back in part two. So Optimus gets catched up on the last episode's events, but honestly, he needs to catch up with the entire series, because when this guy was alive, all of his comrades from seasons one and two were still alive, and now they're dead. He needs to know about Unicron, he also needs to know that Megatron is now Galvatron. Also, I'm fairly certain he has no memory at all of what happened in Dark Awakening. Like, oh yeah, you were also a zombie and you tried to murder everyone. Seriously, if I just woke up from this, I would have some serious questions. I mean, I don't know, I think he'd be pretty mad at Rodimus Prime. Vector Sigma, give me back that fucking Matrix immediately. You've run this organization right out of the fucking ground, Hot Rod. I tried to do my best. If you would let Ultra Magnus have the Matrix like I had intended, then we wouldn't be in this mess now, would we? No, we wouldn't, Optimus, sir. The best you can do is bring me back to life to fix your problems. It's probably the best move as leader that you've ever made. By all accounts, this is one of the better looking animated episodes, and this is the last episode animated by Toei. Now, they would return to animate the exclusive Japanese sequel series, Headmasters, but when it comes to the last episode, with the American cartoon, they did a really good job. Everyone's pretty much shinier, all the character models are on point, and with this being a season finale, they really went all out. Okay, so not all Autobots were infected, some were just badly damaged, and this goes for Bumblebee, who was reformatted into Goldbug by the Quinnison. I mean, I guess he looks friendly. I mean, sure, why not? I can't say I really have an opinion on Goldbug. He just exists. He's there. That's just something they wanted to do for the toys. And this series is almost over. And at this point, I really couldn't care. <laughs> I just simply look at it as like, Bumblebee went from being a bee to a wasp. Gold wasp? Uh, gold mug? Uh, whatever. Okay, so this is amazing. We've got Optimus Prime back. We've got the goat. So tell us, Optimus, how are we going to fight back? How are we going to stop this plague? How are we going to save the world? What's the plan? I have no plan. We just do what they want. How are we going to live with ourselves? From here, the fight will be your own. Wow. So Prime's useless. Okay, so the only answer that can be found is through the Matrix, and unfortunately, Rodimus Prime has the Matrix. But Jessica comes up with an idea on how Optimus Prime can get the Matrix without being infected. I believe I have the answer. It cannot be. Chip Chase, is that you? Now we transition to Galvatron, where he's being attacked by the Decepticons. 
So the Autobots need the metal that he stole in part 1, so they can create a shield for Optimus Prime so he doesn't get infected with the Hate Plague, and somehow Optimus Prime manages to convince him to join him. And this is where the episode really shines for me, these two working together, we get some really good banter between the two. I've explained it to you. You told me it was important, but you didn't tell me why! That's because I know you too well, Galvatron. Now I really like the Char segment. The Autobots have to go through some obstacles and Galvatron is just enjoying their torture. We've got a giant ass spider. Oh my! It looks like I was wrong! <gasps> Autobots can't fly! <laughs> I was ready to help, but I knew you didn't need me! Come along! Why are you not? I love you, Galvatron, you sadistic, purple, horny man. After killing off some worms, they finally get to the metal, but unfortunately, the other Autobots get infected, Jessica gets infected, and in turn, infects Galvatron. I find it kind of weird how they just leave Jessica on char. I mean, she touches Skylink, so shouldn't he be infected? Or whatever. Anyway, Octopus Prime embraces his Ultra Magnus shell and takes on Rodimus. It's pretty much just a game of tug of war. There's nothing really memorable about the choreography, really. It's just like watching your siblings fight. You have no soul. That is why I have no fear. In order to find a cure for the hate plague, Optimus must travel deep within the Matrix and talk to the ancient Autobot leaders. This place is essentially a senior care home. He first speaks with Alpha Trion, but he needs to go deeper and talks to a creature called It. Now, seriously, that's his name on TF Wiki. I love how it's pretty much just Peter Cullen's voice, but they've just pitched it up to a high level. Like you can tell this is Peter Cullen, it's like he's just talking to himself. Contain the spores and send them into the sun, but no one was able to- Okay, no, that's enough for you. Let's move on. So Octopus Prime finally figures out the cure and unleashes the Matrix, and we have the sound cue to prove that it is working. Optimus Prime shall die again! <laughs> There's something just really magical about this, you know, it's a good payoff to the 1986 movie for people who were bitter about Prime's death, you know, having him unleash the touch, there's just something really cool about it, and I think a lot of G1 fans, you know, watching this as a kid, must have just had their hands in the air, like, woohoo, finally, you know, we get that moment. After this though, the episode is in a rush to end, which is fine, I guess, you know, we have a good scene anyway between Optimus Prime and Galvatron, and then we've got the human characters. I can't say what I'm feeling. I'm so terribly sorry. We had no right to do what we did with the spores. And for what we thought and believed of you, we... I deeply apologize. Yeah, whatever. You're both going to jail. I really like this ending for the season, and if this was like the definitive end of the entire series, I would have been happy. We got the Autobots and Decepticons getting along, granted it'd probably be only for a day, but still nonetheless. I feel like they could have added a lot more to this ending, they could have let the song, the touch at least, play out just a little bit longer, uh, because after this we get an advert for Ultra Magnus. Like, really guys? You could have really added more to this episode. But we get an advert for Ultra Magnus, who is barely in this episode. Vehicle mode. Ultra Magnus is an armored transport truck. A machine with magnificent fighting skills. Yeah, it was pretty useless in this two-parter. Now, despite me really enjoying this two-parter, the resurrection of Octopus Prime was too little too late. Of course, he returned just because the kid's reaction to his death was so bad. And I can't blame him, I cried when I was a kid watching this as well. Because Octopus Prime is an important character, not just in the world of Transformers, but he's a pop culture icon around the world. Kids look up to him. Now I could go on on why Optimus Prime means so much to me, but I feel like I've done enough of that already. So for my next collaboration and the final one of this video, I'm going to let Alfonso from Alfonso Nation explain why Optimus Prime means so much to him. Take it away. Hey, what's up, Cam? Alfonso here of the Alfonso Nation. All right, since we're talking about G1 goodness, I got to talk about the center of it all and my favorite character of all time. Optimus Prime. This entire series was the birth of this incredible character, and it was voiced by, at the time, a legend in the making, Peter Cullen. And his influence and example literally altered the course of the collective story as it should. One of the ways G1 Prime uh, stands out unique in this series is his relatability with not only other Cybertronians, 
but humans as well. He's personable, he's humble, he's gracious, he's approachable, but he's also aggressive, and he's wise, and he's consistent, and he's bold when it matters most. The ability to reason with other enemy characters like Galvatron, putting aside the differences for the greater good. The reason this means so much to me is because these exact same characteristics created a precedent and it extended beyond this show. This show was the beginning of it, but it created this, this standard for Optimus Prime. And there's even really powerful messages like, The wisdom of the ages, it's lost. No, not lost. We're all a little wiser now. It's up to all of us to fill it again. With the wisdom we accumulate from this moment on. That's my boy, man. That's my boy. Even a Decepticon, like Galvatron, literally confessed. There will be no war today, Optimus Prime. You have earned Galvatron's respect. And honestly, I can't say I blame him. I am my Optimus Prime, if you couldn't tell. And this show is the beginning of it. And because of that, we are where we are today. Thanks, Cam and everybody. Alfonso signing out. Transformers will return after these messages. Now here's my episode ranking of season 3, and arguably a difficult season to rank, just based on the fact that this is not my favourite. But you know what, when it came to rewatching these episodes for this video, I've kind of found a greater appreciation for the series. Like, I can see what they were trying to do and steer the franchise in a different direction. I don't think it worked out for the most part, but without a doubt, there are some good episodes in this season, so I don't feel like I can be as harsh to season 3 anymore like I used to be as a kid. My favourite episode is of course Starscream's Ghost because there's just so much fun to have with that episode. And my least favourite one, well, Daniel's face says it all. So that's it, the Transformers series has wrapped up. And you know, the return of Optimus Prime did a good send off for the entire series. Absolutely perfect. There should be nothing else to come after this. I'm fairly certain that this is the definitive end for the Transformers Generation 1 cartoon. Please, please let it be the end. Now return to the Transformers.